all these um, other issues having to do with just the way in which um, the, the sort of talk about what the markets require is used to rule out of order a whole set of questions that, or a whole set of, of options that should be on the democratic agenda. The markets say that if we don't cut social spending in a drastic way, the country's credit rating will decline, its currency will be endangered, and so on and so forth. So this is another aspect in which um, the, the money power, if you like, um, constrains the democratic agenda and um, people become scared, even in a country like Greece. In the end, the people, and I say this not to criticize them, it's understandable, the people lost their nerve and wouldn't, uh, in the end, vote, uh, a majority of them, for a party that threatened to anger the markets and the banks and endanger bailouts and so on. So that's another uh, example. And let me mention one last uh, uh, case. And this has to do um, with the um, way in which the, um, the sort of lure of commodities uh, casts a certain pall, a certain shadow over public goods in a democracy. And um, the, the public sector appears uniform, drab, boring uh, in, in terms of these mass public services, whereas the, the private sector, the glitter of the commodity, it, it's sexy, it's, it's tailored just for you, it speaks directly to your desires, supposedly. And this is another example at a deeper structural level of how a sort of, um, let's say, a, a highly marketized, highly privatized economic sector begins to sort of hollow out support for the public sector and for um, the democratic uh, process as such. So four different cases, and I'm sure there are plenty more. The second question is, how does rising social inequality endanger the quality of life, health, security, and the life chances of people? Well, you know, I think there are, um, there's maybe more than one way to address this question. The most obvious way would just be to talk about um, how those on the losing end of this equality that you refer to, this rising in, uh, inequality, how uh, those at, at the bottom are denied basic conditions of living, uh, clean, safe environments to live in. Uh, schooling for their children, clean water to drink, clean air to breathe, um, uh, public services uh, of every kind, access to labor markets so that they can work and uh, gain uh, income and so on. There's a sense in which, um, and Mike Davis used to write about the idea of a planet of the slums, in which, you know, basically two thirds of the population on this planet live outside of the official economy. They live in favelas and slums and off-the-grid communities with no garbage collection, no electricity, no sanitation, all the things that we uh, sitting here take for granted. So, and this is a very toxic way to live. Uh, you see it immediately in very short life expectancies and all sorts of uh, morbidity and, and fatality um, rates. So the very people who, whose chief responsibility it is to do the social reproduction work are you know, being forced to do double and triple uh, shifts with wage work as well at the exact same moment that we have cutbacks of public services. So this is another area in which I wouldn't say it's inequality, although again, the poor are, um, bear the main brunt. Uh, but it's a, um, it's a, um, a pressure, uh, a crisis point that really affects the whole capacity of the society to sustain and reproduce itself for future generations. Okay, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Yes.